thank you for those questions, all good questions. Okay, um, Jeannie, if you're ready, I'm gonna embarrass you while you make your way to the, the podium and then we can switch over. So we have a special guest here as we often like to bring to council members. So Jeannie Morazzo is here. She is the sixth director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases or NIAID. In this role, Jeannie now oversees the Institute's, brace yourself, $6.3 billion budget. So, so just keep in mind, big, larger institute. Uh, leads the nation's efforts to advance our understanding, diagnosis, and treatment of infectious, immunological, and allergic diseases. Uh, prior to joining NIH in the fall of 2023, so just last fall, uh, Jeannie was the director of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, a colleague of Bruce Korff's. Uh, Dr. Morazzo is internationally recognized for her research and education efforts in the field of sexually transmitted infections, especially as they affect women's health. She is a fellow of the American College of Physicians and of the International of the Infectious Disease Society of America. She earned her bachelor's degree in biology from Harvard University, her MD from Thomas Jefferson University, and a master of public health and epidemiology from the University of Washington. She's also chaired the American Board of Internal Medicine Council and the um, uh, American Board of Internal Medicine Infectious Disease Specialty Board. When, when uh, Jeannie got announced, I think within about 10 minutes, I emailed Bruce Korf. By the way, Jeannie, Bruce is on Zoom here. You probably haven't noticed him. Ah, yeah. So hey, Bruce, Bruce is on Zoom. He's a, a brand new council member. I emailed Great. Bruce and said, Bruce, one of your folks is coming to be one of the institute directors. And uh, as is always the case, the council member immediately was right. He said, you're gonna just be thrilled working with her. <laughs> As a friend, he says, she is so now you're gonna love working with her. And as always, council members are right. And indeed, uh, Jeannie and I have quickly become sort of almost soulmates and good friends at NIH for various reasons. First of all, the, we have one thing in common um, to start off with. We both took over an institute that was previously directed by a larger than life figure. Um, <laughs> that is Francis Collins and Tony Fauci. So That's we sure. learned very quickly how to put on shoes that are way oversized for our little feet. Um, we had big shoes to fill, uh, but we figured it out. Uh, second of all, we, we share many uh, personal attributes. You're gonna quickly see, like me, Jeannie's very energetic, she's enthusiastic, she's overwhelmingly approachable, and she has a great sense of humor. I'm just setting you up for I'm gonna be a I, dynamic I mean, this is, talk. This is like, a, I you're hope gonna, I'm feeling well enough to yeah, live up to this, really uh, this to. introduction, I don't know. But in any case, I've enjoyed already helping her learn the ropes, at, uh, at, especially at institute director of meetings where we're often whispering to each other. It's like, <laughs> usually I'm being helpful, not gossiping, but occasionally it's gossip. And I'm just delighted to have the ability to introduce her to another part of the NHGRI family, and that is our advisory council. So Jeannie, take it away. Thanks, Eric. That was. Fabulous. And unlike any introduction I may have ever had, that was like amazing. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to come and talk to you. And it's wonderful to see my uh, former colleague, Bruce. I do miss my Alabama friends, but it's been great to, to have uh, the chance to get to know NIH and my institute a little bit better. Um, just so you know who I am, I am not a geneticist, so that will be become apparent in my comments. I just want to um, sort of fill a little bit in for who I am. I'm, I'm an infectious disease physician. Uh, I take care of adults. Um, my background really was informed, like many of my colleagues, uh, with early experiences in the HIV uh, epidemic. I, I did my residency um, and chief residency at Yale New Haven, which was kind of a microcosm for all the really marginalized groups that were uh, affected by the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, went to the University of Washington uh, and did my fellowship and stayed there for almost a little over 20 years, actually. Um, working with the STI and HIV groups there, and then uh, went to Alabama in 2016 to take over uh, the Division of Infectious Diseases there, and then came here um, just last fall. So I started um, at the end of September. So it's it's been a bit of a whirlwind, but very, very exciting. Um, I think that people are familiar with our mission. Uh, we do biomedical research to better understand and treat infectious, immunologic, and allergic diseases. One thing I will emphasize, though, is that we are one of the only, I believe, institutes that has the dual mission of also responding to urgent public health threats, uh, whether they're biological incidents or emerging infectious diseases. Um, shown there is Building 40, which is where our vaccine research center is. On the upper right is Rocky Mountain Labs, uh, which is often called Bethesda West. Um, I was there last week for the whole week, and um, 
It's a really great place. It is where our BSL-4 laboratory is, a brand new insectary and vivarium, where we'll have some very interesting uh, animal uh, work. Um, it's about 40 acres and 400 employees, so it's, it's fairly substantial. And then down below is our office at Fisher Lane, which is very close. So just some of the things that we do, and, and this is a nice slide for me because I'm one of those people who has worked really closely with basic scientists um, in my work in the translational uh, field. And I, I believe that so much of the uh, incredible advances that we have made have been because people have worked so closely together from the bench to the bedside, um, to the community, right? So it's not just the bedside, it's really out to the community. So a couple things that I really like about NIAD and its work in the last probably decade, of course, Barney Graham's work to um, to figure out that you had to lock the respiratory syncytial virus F protein into its pre-fusion state in order to create a stable potent antigen was really paved the way for doing the same thing for SARS-CoV-2. This is why we managed to go so quickly uh, with the, the, the um, generation of the SARS-CoV-2 antigen that then was licensed for first the Moderna vaccine and then on to uh, 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 BioNTech. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Um, lots of work coming out of that group. Um, the allergy group has done a lot of work on peanut allergies, and you may know now that we're um, not only uh, recommending that kids get exposed to peanuts quite early in order to forestall um, the eventual development of serious allergies, but we now have an antibody, a uh, monoclonal antibody that can be used uh, to essentially really desensitize um, these kids and adults. Um, that trial was recently published, so lots of work there. We've developed a long-acting injectable treatment for HIV prevention, long-acting cabotegravir. It works for men, it works for women. It's very potent. And then, of course, you probably know about the xenotransplantation uh, that happened at Mass General just uh, last month. Unfortunately, the patient um, did not make it probably due to a thrombotic or cardiovascular event, not related to graft rejection. But that wouldn't have been possible without CRISPR in particular, which as you know, I'm sure better than I, really allowed us to get in there and take out all those porcine retroviruses that really was hold, holding up the field for a really long time. So those are just a few things that I think we have really, really deep uh, roots in. Eric mentioned my uh, enviable budget. Indeed, it is enviable, and I, I like it when people just sort of think that I'm like an ATM and they can just come up to me and ask me, you know, can I have whatever. Uh, I wish it worked like that, certainly as an external grantee for my entire career. I wish I had known that I could do that. Um, but, you know, the reality is that that's not how it works. And I, I show this um, to say that, you know, flat funding for all of us is is a, really a budget cut um, it, it, because of inflation and also because of other things that we've got to pay for, right, that we hadn't planned to pay for. We also um, did not get the pandemic uh, preparedness funding uh, that we had planned to have, so we're having to figure out how to make that up. Not, not whining at all, but I will point out that the President's budget, the Senate's budget, and the House appropriation budget are all separate. The Senate and the um, um, President proposed a flat budget here, but the House, you may have heard, proposed a 23.9% cut for NIAID alone along, among the institutes. And that was directly political, directly related to their discomfort or their anger um, with various aspects of NIAID's work during the pandemic. So pretty ironic. Luckily, we landed in a good place, but you know, I think those threats are not over. Um, they're still out there. People are still obviously pursuing uh, various hypotheses and various um, uh, questions. There's a lot going on this week and, and next week, actually. Dr. Fauci's public testimony is June 3rd. His book's also coming out on June 18th, in case you're interested. Um, so it's going to be a big month for NIAID. So hopefully we can we can um, we can keep this going. But even with this, our pay lines are really not great. Um, and I this is something that I'm just 
really getting my hands around and trying to figure out how we can shift these big pots of money to improve the pay lines. I think a new investigator pay, pay line of 14th percentile would send me running to another institute in another field probably at this point. So getting those up and even getting to these this year provisionally required moving some significant money around. We were able to um, uh, keep our non-competing grants at 100%, but I'm not sure we should. Um, other institutes have actually taken a little bit of that money to affect the pay line here. At NIAID, that's always been sacrosanct. So um, I've actually created a, a funding, a training funding task force because I really want to look at how much we support our young investigators in particular. If you look at our ability to support training grants, and I think I may have a, a slide or, of this coming up, um, it's really not as good as many of the other big institutes, particularly NCI. So we're faced with some tough choices. We can't do everything, but I do think that we have to address some of these priorities. Uh, mentioned the budget request for 2025. Eric's probably told you about this, but for NIH overall, it's proposed to be a level budget. Um, we have a budget request that is slightly bigger than last year, but as I said, no guarantees. We have done very well over the last two decades for a couple of reasons, um, not the least of which was Dr. Fauci's you know, advocacy and excellent bipartisan relationship until a couple years ago um, with the appropriators. Um, so we had a big increase just after 9-11 in the anthrax incidents on Capitol Hill because of bioterrorism. So lots of work, lots of money went into that. And then in the teens, um, a lot of recognition that with Ebola, um, SARS, MERS, that emerging viral respiratory viruses were a really big deal and we needed to do more preparedness. So we were thankfully in good shape. Um, when the actual pandemic did happen. Um, but we're probably looking at, at a flat budget, if not cuts in the coming months. So the last time we did a strategic plan was in 2017. And I want to point out that we are in the process of doing a new one. Um, and our priorities are listed there. They're probably very, um, very familiar to you. But we are trying to do something a little different. Sorry for that um, weird uh, uh, formatting. Um, what I am planning, I, you know, I like the strategic planning process. Many people roll their eyes. Um, I, I actually love strategic planning because I like to challenge people um, and really talk about what we've done, where we're going, and what was, what do we really get out of it? I also don't really particularly want to generate a nice brochure that people put on their coffee table and then put in the recycling bin two weeks later. Um, so this is going to be more of a living document. We're going to try to update it on an annual basis. This uh, summer, I'm going to report back and hear what I tell people what I heard. We have an RFI out there um, with a deadline of the end of this month for people to get back to us. And we've gotten some really good feedback, largely from professional organizations and from uh, from some prominent members of the community. Uh, so anyway, you're welcome to take a look at this or just talk to me. Um, and actually, maybe after you hear some of the things I'm going to talk about in our clinical genomics program, you may have some thoughts, and that would be great. So Eric's invitation to talk to you was great because it made me explore an area that I hadn't really dived into yet. And many of this may be familiar to you, but I just wanted to highlight a few things that we have done um, largely on the intramural side um, to advance some work that Eric and I have been talking about pushing even further. And, and I think that would be really uh, interesting. So, so we both realized that not every patient who comes into the clinical center is um, has a genomic sequence, but many do. And the ones that do not only are uh, done through some of the work that Eric has cited in the Undiagnosed Diseases Program, but also through the NIAID Centralized Sequencing Program. And this is something that was established in 2017. And anybody who comes into the clinical center um, is eligible for genome sequencing through this protocol. Um, and recently, uh, it's been expanded to include other NIH institutes and the Children's National Health System. So what this looks like really um, is 
uh, taking a look at, um, at the genetic sequences, both for primary diagnosis of syndromes, as Eric described, for undiagnosed diseases, um, secondary findings, or other things that may be interesting to uh, help you figure out what's going on with these patients. The key thing here is that it incorporates a couple of things that I think will be very useful as we think about expanding the, the sequencing to many more populations. There's a universal consent um, that we have, that, that the group has worked out very closely with the bioethics people. And then there are four medical geneticists um, that are part of this program who are very involved in counseling both before and after the results um, are giving. So, um, and, and there are some interesting um, uh, sort of more uh, biobehavioral um, sort of social um, aspects of how people understand these results, how, um, how it affects what they do, and how uh, particularly parents feel about their kids getting these results back. So it spawned kind of a very nice um, I would say, group of, of projects. These are some of the um, institutes that have been involved. Um, and in fact, they have managed to sequence one in six new clinical center patients this last year. So I think with more concerted work with, um, with this institute, we can probably double that in no time. Uh, double that would not be very much, but maybe uh, increase it by sixfold. Um, in the next uh, year or two, that would be that would really be our goal. So we so basically this all falls under what we call the NIAID Clinical Genomics Program, and it's aimed to really accelerate research um, that will help us understand, treat, and manage disorders of the immune system, largely as it encounters pathogens. So that's obviously the window that we look at it look at it at. Um, it's a virtual center that uh, coordinates groups and resources to catalyze these collaborations, and it was established in 2014 by uh, Michael uh, Leonardo um, and Helen Sue. And I'll just give you uh, a good example, which you may already know the story, but I, I found this very compelling. I did not know about this rare disease um, until I got here and heard the story. And it's just, I think, a fantastic example of who we are and why we are unique uh, in our ability to interface between detection of really rare syndromes and then just hunt down the causes and follow it all the way through to really miraculous therapies. So this is just a great example. Um, this is something called uh, Chapel disease. Um, and what it is is CD55 deficiency with hyperactivation of complement angiopathic thrombosis and severe protein losing enteropathy. And the weird thing about it is that it was a sort of a constellation of symptoms that seemed incredibly disparate. And for a long time, nobody could figure out what the common pathway was that was cause, causing all of those symptoms uh, up there, most notably abdominal pain that was really relentless loss of appetite, terrible chronic malabsorption, which of course led to the hypoproteinemia and uh, recurrent in, infections. Um, it started out quite a long time ago in 1961 when Dr. Waldman of the National Cancer Institute discovered uh, patients with unusually low concentrations of immunoglobulins in their blood. And not just that, but that they were losing that protein through enlarged lymph vessels that supplied the lining of the small intestine, which is very bizarre. I mean, it, it was not something that you would think of. Um, he published in 1967 with his team a comprehensive case report characterizing these patients and the National Organization of Rare Diseases called it Waldman disease. So how does that fit into what we do currently? Um, Mike Leonardo in our institute was actually recruited in 1989 by Dr. Waldman. Um, and Mike is currently the chief of the molecular development section in our lab of immune systems biology. And ultimately, this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine from 2017, so it's been a long road, um, used a combination of metabolomics, genomics, um, immunogenetics to figure out what was really going on, going on here. And ultimately, they identified the genetic cause of the disease as a biallelic loss of function, um, mutations in the gene encoding CD55, uh, decay accelerating factor, and that leads to a loss of protein expression. expression. So basically, the patient's T cells um, show increased complement activation. You get surface deposition of complement, generation of soluble C5A, um, but the defective sort of 
co-stimulatory function of CD55 gives you this uh, very, very bad cycle that causes all of the things that I just, just mentioned. So what this ended up doing was getting people to think about ways to um, either genetically reconstitute CD55 or treat with a complement inhibitory therapeutic antibody, which is where they went. And that turned out to be something related to eculizumab, which you may know um, is now treated, uh, now used to treat paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria in a typical hemolytic uremic syndrome. So the patient on the right um, is a patient um, who started out um, quite ill, as you can see, and after treatment with eculizumab, um, that's what you're seeing um, on the other side. So it was really an amazing success story. So those were just sort of anecdotal. The next step was actually to do a clinical trial um, with uh, a, 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 a bespoke um, monoclonal antibody, which turned out to be pozelumab, a humanized IgG4 targeting uh, complement factor C5. Um, and this was done in concert with, um, with Regeneron, who, um, who provided the, the, the product. So this started in May of 2021 um, and was just um, uh, finished last spring. And um, this is a patient who came to the clinical center from Bolivia. So another thing to focus on, as I showed you, when you looked at that virtual consortium, um, this really requires patients from all over the world because these diseases are so rare. And one thing that's really interesting is that they tend, as you probably know, to cluster in places where there's a fair amount of consanguinity. So um, particularly excited about some projects that we are really ramping up in North Africa um, and the Middle East where um, some of these things are, are seen uh, more commonly than others. So what did we see in this exciting study where we finally got to take a look um, in a um, in an open label treatment, um, looking at uh, patients in Turkey, Thailand, and the US. Um, there were 10 uh, patients in the study. This is not a study you can randomize large numbers of people in, but it was really remarkable. So this is truly the power of merging genomic medicine um, with discovery, with then the develop of, of therapy that's related to this. So what you're looking at there on the upper right-hand side are, is a hospitalizations chart um, that's looking at hospitalizations as shown by X um, either before or after treatment, and you can see treatment started at day zero, and there's only one hospitalization in one patient after uh, this started. And even more beautifully, the serum albumin concentrations just climbed dramatically in all of these patients. Um, and that was published um, in The Lancet um, just last February. So truly, I think, a uh, testament to how we could work even more together uh, to do this across institutes and, and get things going. I, the last, um, and, and, and he, I guess this is really the best part of the story, is that the FDA last August approved this drug for chapel disease, and that's um, our first pa our patient after treatment. I think he was going to a dance. Um, so it's really kind of a miracle, uh, and I think it's it's just um, a great reason for us to continue talking. One more um, really recent example is um, this mucosal fungal susceptibility due to APECED, A-P-E-C-E-D, in a potential treatment. Um, this is a p paper that was published um, in Science in 2021 and reflects the fact that um, our investigators discovered a new pathway responsible for susceptibility to mucosal uh, fungal infection that was basically caused by excess interferon gamma production, disrupting the oral epithelial barrier, allowing for candida to invade and cause disease. Um, this is a monogenic disease called APSED, also known as APS1, and it's caused by an AIRE deficiency that impairs central tolerance in the thymus and leads to, as I mentioned, mucosal candidiasis and multi-organ autoimmunity. So um, very, very nice paper that figured out what was going on here. But then even uh, more importantly, realizing that because it was this interferon gummopathy, you could target it with JAK inhibitors, uh, which is exactly uh, what was done. And this paper, which is now in press, um, essentially shows that you can use uh, JAK, JAK inhibitors to um, now really currently enroll these patients to, to look at the effect. 
um, and hopefully provide um, what we'll see is the remarkable improvement in uh, pre and post patients shown there. So you can see what's happening to that patient's hair and then in the GI tract, um, the autoimmune manifestations. So pretty cool stuff, um, I think, and um, really, um, I think, point to opportunities for us to engage even more in the future. Um, we have uh, the NOT noted there that um, is looking at inborn errors of immunity and primary immunodeficiencies. But then Eric and I are very excited at an upcoming workshop, probably this December, where we are going to both sponsor a really, I think, hopefully vigorous discussion of how we can focus um, the application of knowledge that we're getting from host genomics and infection to clinical care. Um, obviously a wide open area and um, should be really, really fun. I have a couple of slides on this only if people want to hear about it because it's been taking up the bulk of my life um, the last two, two um, three, four weeks, I guess. Um, I'll just mention that um, this has probably been going on now. For those of you who can't see the slides, I'm talking about highly pathogenic avian influenza probably since December or January, if you look at the evolutionary uh, trees of the bovine and the human sample. Uh, it was noticed that some of these dairy cows, particularly in Texas, Kansas, probably Ohio, were not producing milk as much and they were mouth breathing, um, which means they probably had some respiratory distress, um, although people haven't really been talking about that. Bottom line is they had mastitis with incredible viral loads of the h 5 N1, uh, which is avian influenza. And of course, avian influenza has been spreading in migratory wild, wild birds for years now and was associated with massive die-offs of marine mammals in the last couple of years. So this has been percolating. And we've known and been very scared of it getting into farms, largely because of pigs. Pigs are the ultimate mixing bowl for uh, for. Um, flu viruses in general because they've got receptors for both human and avian influenza. Well, it didn't get into pig, but it somehow got into the cow's mammary uh, glands. Um, and although we've not detected live virus in pasteurized milk, um, we have had a case of conjunctivitis. I'm sure there are more cases, everything I've heard uh, because of a lot of concerns uh, with people coming forward on the farms, many undocumented workers, um, many migrant workers, really not going to come in to have surveillance done. Many of their employers, frankly, don't want them to have surveillance done. They don't want the farms associated uh, with so this sort of thing. So this is kind of a hot mess, to be honest. Um, and we'll see what happens. Um, I'll show you one more slide on it, but but it is something I think to really pay uh, attention to. It's good that the virus that we have gotten so far from the birds and the cows does not really seem to have evolved resistance to our current therapies. Um, it also seems that the vaccines that we have in the stockpile for this are probably going to provide some protection, but I can't say with 100% um, that that's the case. There's also a lot of raw milk out there. And after this was announced, the consumption of raw milk went up because people believe and have touted that you can get immune um, by drinking raw milk. I don't know if you knew that, but, but drinking raw milk confers, they believe, immunity. I'm being sarcastic. Hopefully you know that I'm being sarcastic. Um, so that's a real problem. But this is what keeps me up a little bit, in addition to all that, is that people are not really talking about the cats and the peri domestic animals. So there, um, these farms, uh, there were lots of dead cats um, on the farms that people were talking about. Um, and they've managed to get a couple of these into necropsy, and the cats have high mortality rate of about 70%. They've got lots of virus all over their bodies and almost certainly are getting this just from drinking um, the milk, um, the, the unpasteurized milk. So it's kind of a proof of concept that drinking really very infected milk could conceivably get this virus into mammals where it really doesn't belong, gets into the GI tract. It probably is getting in through the respiratory epithelial cells and the nasal pharynx just from drinking. So it's not like you've got to aerosolize it. And in fact, paper coming out in New England Journal from one of our groups this week showing that just feeding it to mice um, results in disseminated disease. So, you know, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a pretty picture. Um, but we are on it. 
to the extent that we can be on it with our flat budget, I will just point out, even though it is $6.5 billion, um, we are working on, on the basic research side, um, obviously the vaccine side, and, uh, and the therapeutic side. So that's all I have. I can't thank you enough for your time. Um, hopefully it wasn't too long, and happy to take any questions if Eric lets me. I, I am sure council and even staff will have questions. I'll take the first one. I just have to bite at the obvious. I mean, here he is. You talk about how no pandemic preparedness money coming in just at a time when we might be seeing what could be the absolute need for pandemic preparedness. The irony yeah. couldn't be any more striking. It's true. And we have, uh, as you know, Eric, our first congressional testimony this Thursday. So um, it's the first one for Dr. Bertignoli. It's the first one for me. Um, it'll be a chance to hopefully make that case. It is the Senate, so I'm hoping it will be more friendly, hopefully. Um, but yeah, it's, it's um, you know, we're, we're not... We're not being greedy here. We really do need to sort of make sure we are well prepared uh, to deal with this. Um, yeah, interesting times. Questions? And comments, too. If people really, truly want to comment on our interactions in our strategic plan, I would love it if you would just reach out. You can email me. Eric can put, can put you in touch. Put a, you know, even if it's just a few sentences, say we should do more work together. You know, that there's these incredible opportunities. It, it really would help. What do you do with your initial, what, what is your plan for your initial document that you produce? For this? Because we, you know, we, every institute does it differently. Yeah. We always publish ours in Nature, for example, to actually put no, 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 it out in a That's a great idea. Room. I don't know. We haven't talked about that. I don't think they've published it. I'm sure NIAD has not published it in any. We've published separate components. Yeah. So we have a pandemic preparedness plan, yeah. 2021. You know, we've done various pathogen specific tuberculosis. A lot of them are congressionally mandated. So that's the other thing, right? We have to, we actually have to do um, specific strategic plans for like tuberculosis, uh, for example. But this should be a little bit different. And I, I like the idea of putting it someplace prominent. Yeah, I always, I do worry that some of the ones, uh, not to disparage other instances, I mean, yeah. sometimes they publish, they, they, they print these things. I don't even think they publish them, they print them. Yeah. And I don't, think people even know about them. But there's boxes of them in, at the NIH that's campus exactly you hand right. out at meetings, but it, they don't know about it. you got to get out in the and literature. And let's, let's be frank. The narrative form, we love to hear ourselves talk. We love to edit. We love to write. It's not really going to grab the next generation, right? So right. we're trying to work on some infographics and some, some linked um, um, uh, goals with strategies and sort of some more hopefully catchy um, not TikTok, you know, kind of thing, but some some catchy things that will get people to pay attention, hopefully. Judy, and maybe introduce yourself also. Yeah, I'm Judy Cho. Uh, I'm from the Mount Sinai, Icon School of Medicine in Mount Sinai, New York. Um, so this is very high level and broad, but how do you combine, how do you think about climate change and uh, the viral? Yeah. I mean, I worry that it gets dropped between institutes and um, yeah. in terms of how this changes the yeah. geography of the pathogens in the U.S. and worldwide. Yeah, it's a huge focus. I could have brought five or six slides on it because I just talked to somebody about this last week. Um, it's a big one for us because, you know, we now have, we had a case of malaria in Maryland last year. We have dengue now well in the United States. We have malaria um, in some other states, um, some fungal infections and tick-borne in infections, the footprint has sped massively because the vectors are just able to get so many more places. Um, and I, I do think it's ironic that the governor of Florida just like wiped out climate change just as the, in, in the legislation and policy. I don't know if you saw this, but it was taken off some documents because it doesn't apparently exist, just as more cases of dengue, vibrio, all these things are being reported uh, in Florida, malaria. So it's a really big focus for us. Um, we are working with um, the Climate Change Initiative. We're funding some work. We're funding some developing um, uh, young faculty in this area. Uh, it's, it's a really huge one. And it's not just vectors. It's also the disasters um, in particular and the instability of the weather and, and climate systems causing really compromised water supplies. So enteric infections are a really big, really big issue. Just because you don't have enough political issues, you want to 
also have to deal with yeah. climate change as part Maybe of Maybe that's your... why I didn't bring any slides yeah, on. Right. Not that I thought you guys were going to tell on me. <laughs> Other? Erin, introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Erin Ramos um, in the Division of Genomic Medicine. And so, well, first of all, that was fantastic. And I just wanted to take an opportunity to let you know if you're not already aware and also counsel. Um, council is familiar with our Clinical Genome Resource Program, or ClinGen. That's an effort, sort of a global effort, where we've brought experts together to curate genes and variants that mm -hmm. are relevant for, for precision medicine. So we do have an immunology clinical domain. Um, we have a couple of gene and variant expert panels assembled. Um, they're looking at, just want to get this right, antibody deficiencies uh, for gene curation, primary immune regulatory disorders, and also SCID. So it's a nice yep. foray into an additional it's, collaboration, and hopefully we can do more. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, again, I don't don't mean to be naive presenting you know this, because truly I don't know the whole landscape, but it, it's a great way to start talking about it and really think how we you know, how we can complement each other, especially with our resources, you know, not necessarily looking like they're going to continue to go up. So there's so much expertise and so much opportunity. I think it'll be really fun. Terry? Hi, I'm Terry Midolio, and... Um, ah, Terry, hi. It's yes, so hi. nice to meet you in yes, person. nice to meet you. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, so uh, I just wanted to, to mention, thank you for, for mentioning the, uh, the genomic medicine meeting that we have coming up on host genomics and infectious diseases that we're very much looking forward to. Our genomic medicine working group had identified the potential to collaborate with other institutes, and Eric said, the one we have to start with is NIAID. So we're delighted to have that coming up. Great. In December uh, 12th to 13th. And to, okay, to further you. contextualize it, but w w which number will it be? It'll be 16. Yeah, so, you know, our uh, the council knows our, annu our roughly annual genomic medicine. We've had one through 15. I, mean, I don't know if you realize this is the 16th in a series of these meetings. No. We just always have different topics, but this is number 16. And, so that's the meeting the first, she talked about. Yeah. Yeah, this is the first one that we've done with another institute. Oh, so we're right. very excited about yeah. it. Yeah, so I think that is perfect because it really sets a new tone. Um, I also noted this is like your 106. The advisory council. Oh my second. God! Did you do something massive for your hundred? I guess it was yes, we the did. I bought them cake. We had cake right in this room. Okay. And balloons. Wow. Yeah, I'm sorry, I missed. That. And music, actually. Now that I think about. It. <laughs> sorry, I missed had, that. And balloons, and yes, balloons and cake and music. Yeah, we we, we had a party. Okay, I'm glad yeah. to hear that. Yeah, but you've had you, but you've had far more than 102. You're, you've been around a lot longer. You I probably don't think don't they counted know. them, but you, maybe you, I. You maybe have I need to do that. Maybe I need to do that. All right. Well, thank Anything you so else? much, everybody. Right. Please, um, please reach out. Be delighted to work with folks. And I really want to thank Eric both for his um, invitation, but also for his friendship and, and really warm welcome. Everybody's been fantastic. So thanks, Eric. Thank you.